right now. I don't know if it's because Tennessee's so good at football or what it is, but something in life feels good and it feels like that a new beautiful season starting for our church is one of my favorite messages. This is like a life message, if you will. So in Matthew 7, what we see is that listeners would have considered what's called the alluvial sand on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. So this is a photo of what that sand would look like. And you could imagine that this hardened, uh, Justin, can we grab that sand photo? You would imagine then that this is a place where you would think I could build a house on this. But this sand, as you can see, when it's dried out, looks like it could at any point you could build whatever you want on it. But what they knew was is that once the rain season came, this sand would begin to deteriorate little by little and explode out from underneath the foundation of your home. So wise people that wanted to build around the Sea of Galilee knew that they had to dig about 10 feet deep and then lay a foundation. So Jesus quite literally is given an example in this text of Are you quickly, this is a question for you today that the text of Jesus gives us, are you building your life quickly on the words of culture or carefully on the words of Jesus? Quickly, meaning whatever everyone else does, you're in on doing that. Chris, can I bring this down a little bit? It's getting mad. That that are you building so quickly to say, that looks like a good idea, let's build our life on that. Or are you doing the hard work, the diligent work, which is what I'm going to ask you to do by the end today, to get to the bottom and carefully build your life on the words of Jesus? And what I mean by this is simple things like, who taught you how to view money? Who taught you how to view sexuality? Who in your life? Who's the person that taught you how to view rest? Who taught you how to be a parent? Who taught you? Um, how to view politics, who taught you how to view a nation, who taught you how to view anger, who taught you how to view oaths, who taught you how to view debt, who taught you. So if you can't give the name of that, then it's this quick thing that's happening, the culture around you. Or are you carefully doing the words of Jesus to where you could increasingly say, well, who taught you anger? Jesus taught me anger. Who taught you money? Jesus taught me money. Who taught you forgiveness? Jesus taught me forgiveness. Who taught me marriage? Jesus taught me marriage. Are you building like that? The words of Jesus and the culture couldn't be further apart, Matthew 5, 43 and 44, which are the words that precede this text. So this text takes place in what we call as believers, the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' manifesto. He goes into the mountains, which is what all of those who are starting a movement would do, is they would go into the mountains and those who wanted to follow this um, itinerant minister or whoever this person claimed to be would sit, and then they would sit at the feet of the rabbi, and then he would begin to teach what he believed and you would decide if you want to follow him or not. So Jesus is quite literally teaching what is so different about him compared to everybody who came before him and everyone who would come after him. And just in these two verses, look at the difference. Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So quickly, you would build your life on this idea. Love those who love you and hate those who hate you. Those are the quick words of culture. The Jewish culture taught that. The Gentile culture taught that. The Roman culture taught that. And then Jesus says, but I say to you, he's inviting them into a conversation, a thought process. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So Jesus is quite literally saying in Matthew 7, that there is a way of life that will last no matter what happens. And as an example, he's saying like in that text, if you will love your enemies, that's the kind of life that lasts. So here's a picture of a house on a Mexico beach that a hurricane came through and knocked over everything, but one house is still standing. This is the vision that Jesus is painting, that there is a way of living, a way to be human, if you will, that will look like this when everything around you looks like that. So Jesus is quite literally teaching that what's crushing you in life is not circumstance, but your way of life. So he's quite literally teaching that it's not the rain that's crushing you. It's not the deadlines at work. It's not the stresses at home that's crushing you. It's raining and it's hard. But what you're being crushed over is your way of life. Jesus shows us in Gethsemane when his life was raining that even when he died, the best that rain could do in his life was bring resurrection. 
So what Jesus is quite literally teaching is there is a way to be human to where even when everything in your world has gone wild, bonkers, bananas, you can look like that. You can be that sure to where at a minimum the hard season will produce resurrection. Something new, something better, something more full. And this isn't life coach podcast nonsense where it's do these three things and be financially secure in a storm. This is something that is way deeper than that. He's saying the storms will come, the rains will build up. But these homes like this don't just happen. All of the materials that would have been used in this home before they were ever put on a house would have been what's called hurricane tested, which means they would have put them in a vacuum and had the winds go up to 200 miles an hour. They would have tried to break it, tear it down. So here's what Jesus is saying to you, person who's moving so quick through life, you believe every podcast you listen to and everything around you, you just see as neutral information. He's saying that you've got to be smart enough. Here's what's so crazy about the Christian faith. Everyone says, how can you think and be a Christian? And Christianity says, you can only be a Christian if you think. I want you to take what you believe and put it in the pressure chamber of a rainstorm and ask yourself, does it still work? Ask yourself, think about it, contemplate life. Your life is falling apart because of your way of life, not your circumstances. So Jesus very purposefully says, you heard it said. Once again, going back to our question we started with, are you building your life quickly on the words of culture or carefully on the words of Jesus? So you have heard it said, meaning your culture has told you this. So if you want to know why you think what you think, and I know everyone in here is an intelligent being who's made up their own mind and determined their own truth, and you came to your own decisions, except that is so false. That's not even remotely true. You have not had one original thought in your life. You are this weird amalgamation of where you grew up. You're like, no, I hate where I grew up. You are then in a weird amalgamation of hating where you grew up and then of people who said something weird to you, but it sounded true, so you believed it. You were listening into a podcast and this person gave three life tips and you took one and a half of them and all of that pours into that really brilliant brain you have and then you believe things. So if you want to know how you arrive at them, your beliefs are socially formed by your host culture and your chosen culture. Going to get a little offensive here, but you need to see life here in a moment. Your beliefs are socially formed by your host culture, America, and then your chosen culture, how you identify. So let's talk about socially formed first. In dictatorships, they tell you what to think with bullets and blood. We live in what would be called a soft totalitarian reign right now where social pressure teaches you what to think. So there's not going to be a military officer coming to your door saying this is what you think. It will be a singer who packs out arenas saying, well, here's what the cool people think. And that's why we wear all the same clothes. And that's why we feel the same way about all the things we feel about. So it's not that the, the it's, uh, here's why you should get this medical treatment. And why should you listen to me? I'm a successful tight end in the NFL. That is how this works in our day. Okay? It's this guy is rich. So you should listen to his thoughts on marriage because there's never been anyone who was rich who didn't also have the keys to the wise marriage as well. So listen to this person. They own a lot of land. This is how it works. We lived through this during COVID. Everyone did dumb things during COVID. If you want a list of the dumb things we did, nearly all of them were dumb. And what it was was your social pressure that was leading you to do them. I will never, if there is a Google Earth photo of me and Mike Tropiano at Saunders Ferry Park, this was during the, like, the distancing, uh, we wanted to hang out, and Mike's sitting like 10 yards away from me, and I'm sitting in my camping chair, and Mike's sitting in his camping chair. Hey, Mike, how's life going over there? I'm probably putting more spit out into the wind trying to get over to him. But why did that image make sense? Well, because we... Definitely, we're going to be sitting next to each other in public. And everyone's being socially formed. So, so then your host culture and chosen culture. So our host culture, here in America, we believe everyone should be wealthy. I'm not arguing against it. I'm just telling you that's what we believe. So your beliefs are socially formed by your host culture. Your host culture is saying you're not successful if you're not wealthy. Here's what wealthy looks like. But then your chosen culture teaches you how to get wealthy. Are you Republican or Democrat? 
So your American belief that everyone should be wealthy is going to inform that, but then your chosen culture is going to tell you how everyone should get wealthy. Everyone in our country believes that no one's arguing for enemy love, okay? So your culture is teaching you it's okay to hate your enemy, but then your chosen culture is teaching you who the enemies are and who to hate. Now, I know that you think, no, I'm making my own decision. It's not possible. We're social beings. We come up with stuff based off the societies we run with. Uh, Our host culture teaches everyone should live the good life. And then your chosen culture says, what does a good life look like? If your chosen culture is suburban world, a good life looks like, what is it, the white picket fence? Or nowadays, the nine-foot privacy fence? Or if you grow up in a more liberal, um, open environment, then the good life may look like owning little to nothing and doing whatever you want with your time and body. I mean, it, it, it's an oversimplification, but Jesus is saying that this is happening whether you know it or not. But then Jesus is going on to say, whether it's Democrat, Republican, Northern or Southern, East Coast, West Coast, doesn't matter. If he didn't teach it, it isn't reliable. So he's saying this, the ways of the world are unreliable because they are neither sustainable or good. So the person who built their home on the sand, Jesus is saying it's foolish because that way of living is not sustainable, which means it's not good. If I was a contractor and I built you a home knowing that the foundation would cave in on you the first time a big storm came, then it would be fair to say that that contractor is evil and not good. So Jesus is quite literally saying, if he didn't teach it, it's not a bad idea, it's evil and not good, because it will not sustain you. Take, for instance, Matthew 5, 43. Love your, uh, in their day, they believe loved your, those who love you and hate your enemies. That's not sustainable. That level of anger and hatred in your soul will eat your soul alive. It's not sustainable. You're going to call some of your best friends enemies in a given situation, cut them out of your life, and hate some of the people who should have been a biggest gift to you. That's not sustainable which means it's also not good to live that way. Just going through the same Sermon on the Mount, three more examples at how the ways of the world are neither sustainable nor good. The world would say you should worry about what you eat and drink. That is not sustainable. That level of financial worry in your life will corrode your soul into an anxiety that will make you feel like a prisoner. And it's not good because of what it does to the mind to worry about what you eat or drink. So even if you're listening to a podcast from a professing believer who's teaching you how to worry about your clothing and your food, Jesus would say, this is not good. What about the teaching Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This is not sustainable. Everyone would be marred. (laughs) What about the teaching that the Jewish people would give is that if you lust in your heart, it's okay as long as you don't commit lust with your body in the form of adultery. So here's what the world teaches. Sexual desire is okay if not physically acted upon unlawfully. We believe that today. One political party would define unlawfully different than the other political party, but both of them missed a mark on what Jesus would teach. Jesus would teach that sexual desire is not even okay. Even if you're not unlawfully acting on it, if it's in your soul, because that level of lust will pervert your mind. That level of lust will cause you to see people transactionally. And that's not sustainable, and that's not good, because if a whole culture of people see one another from this, what are you going to have to do with your body to get attention in 2030? So the difficulty of all these teachings is just like with any house, the foundation is always hidden. It's always below the surface. I've never went through, I've bought like three homes in my life. And the last question on my mind was, what's the foundation like? I just want to know if it looks good because that's all I care about. Now, which one will crush me is the foundation. I just want to know if we have the trendy Gaines family uh, treatments in the house. Do we have wooden beams if those are in? If those are in right now, I would love to have this house because there's a wooden beam in it. Well, do you want to know about the foundation, Daniel? No, quite frankly, I don't. I just want to walk in and feel good about the home that I'm moving into. And this is what Jesus is saying. No shade on the Gaines. But this isn't how you build your life intellectually. 
Because the hidden foundation is why you're being crushed in your life. So what he's saying is, is you've got to slow down, which may mean you have to take a couple days off of work before you make these big decisions and live in this life. Dig out all of the infrastructure of your life and all the excuses you make on why you believe what you believe and quite literally look at your beliefs and say, hmm, are these sustainable or good? And that is the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Now, I can tell you if your foundation's bad. Just like a foundation is hidden, there's signs that it's not okay. The drywall starts cracking. It's the only one I know. But I can tell you what it is in the spiritual. How can I know if your way of life is built on a bad foundation? There's signs. I'll tell you one from my own life right now. I get angry real fast. That's my soul saying, Daniel, there's a cracking foundation in you because healthy humans don't get angry that fast. So something's going on in your belief to make you think that you deserve to be mad right now. Are you flat out exhausted after a nine hour work day? Humans have been working for nine hours for a long time. Why are you not bouncing back? Something's going on. Now, obviously there's health things, but I'm talking about, you know, you're fine, you should be fine. Why are you making more money than you ever have before, but your anxiety is skyrocketing? It's because there is foundational things in your way of life that are exposing you at that moment, and there are invitations from the Spirit to say, hey, let's just dig a little deeper, and let's build on some things that actually will matter. The dirty little secret of this church is many of us are one big storm away from emotionally caving in. So Jesus is inviting us into a way of life as demonstrated in the Son of God, the third person of the Trinity. So what is the storm that Jesus is referencing here? Typically, during this sermon, the preacher will say, if you go through a financial storm, praise God. If you built your life on tithing, if you're going through an emotional, praise God. You know what the storm he's talking about here is? It's the storm that we all dread the most. He says this in verse 24, in studying scripture, let's look at this transition right here. Everyone then who hears these words. So everyone then means go back and read what he just said. Because he made a point, and he's saying, if you're listening to me, then you'll do these next few things. So even then, is saying, go back and consider what I said, and now do everything that I'm about to tell you to do. And what were the verses that Jesus said? What is the storm in verse 21 through 23? Death. Not losing your job, not terminal illness. Jesus is quite literally saying this question. When you die, will your way of life make more or less sense? Will the people that you hated, will it make more sense or less sense? Will what you did in the secret make more sense or less sense? Will your beliefs on money make more sense the day you die or less sense? That's the storm. Now, does it apply to life storms? Sure. Will your prayer life make more sense or less sense at death? How busy you are, will it make more sense or less sense? This is what Jesus is quite literally asking us. Everything in our culture is about avoiding the thought of death. We are the only culture in the history of the world that celebrates that you still look 30 when you're not. And it's to our despair because how we view old age is built on the quick teachings of this culture. The scriptures say you should be proud of old age, but we're trying to watch enough Netflix to not realize that our hip hurting was letting us know you're getting towards the end of this journey. We're trying to figure out everything we can to inject anything we can into our body to not avoid. So this has not been the case with our faith. Here's a painting of St. Jerome. St. Jerome translated the Bible into Latin. You'll notice that in all of, first off, this guy needs a shirt. Secondly, sorry, I didn't realize that, that you'll see a skull here. Okay, he's not gothic, just trying to like, he didn't get his clothes from Hot Topic. He didn't get his clothes from anywhere. So like this little skull right here, this skull right here, why would you have a skull on your desk? Was it Halloween when they painted this? No, he's reminding himself that he would die one day. 
a lot of monastic um, people who live a monastic life, they quite literally would dig their grave and walk by it every day to remind themselves. And everyone in here knows digging a hole is incredibly difficult. So like you had to be very committed to digging this. And every day you would walk by it and remind yourself, I'm going to die. And the Christian teachings, which there are so many of them that talk about living in light of eternity, what part of your life will make the most sense? This is this picture of looking at the end and looking back. When that rain comes, Ernest Becker has a book. He's not a believer, so this is not, it's a tough read. Uh, it's called The Nadal of Death. He says this, The prospect of death wonderfully concentrates the mind. So when you think about the end, what do you want to think about lust? The whole ruse of the Genesis garden was Satan saying, don't think about the end, think about right now. YOLO, right? You only live once. Well, I don't want to die early either, so I don't know what the acronym is for that, but but just don't think about what's coming. In the psalmist, Psalm 90, 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. When I was younger and my parents both worked, so during the summer we were home by ourselves. I've shared this story before. And my friends across the street were from a different nation. Their parents didn't speak English. So we were able to get whatever videos we wanted from Blockbuster because they was like, sure, whatever. So if we wanted to watch the Blair Witch Project, we just would go over to our friend's house while my parents were at work and there it was waiting on us, okay? And we would watch the movie. This was during the age of, uh, I don't know how many times these words are about to be said from a sermon today, of Jerry Springer. <laughs> and, and so we, if you're not sure what it is, uh, if people like, let's go back to the good old days, I don't know that there were good old days because <laughs> those were my days and they weren't good old. And, and so we had the Jerry Springer tape at the time. This is pre-streaming. So there's like a, a black brick that you have to put into the VCR and put it in. Well, when my, so we were having a great time watching Jerry Springer and, and knowing anyways. And then, so my dad who suddenly comes home and then we're watching the tape and I'm I'm like, oh no. So I like, I'm hitting the button. I'm hitting the button, waiting for the block to come out and it comes out and I'm trying to hide it. Now, this is this vision of what he's saying when the rain comes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're having a good time right now. It's really fun, isn't it? When your heavenly father walks in, it's not quite so fun. And it's not that I was afraid that my father was going to be mean to me. It's that I was designed to want to please my father. And I knew what I was doing was unpleasing to him out of his love for me. So what Jesus is quite literally saying, imagine that the heavenly father shows up from the work of the heavens. Now, of course, we know he sees all, he knows all. What ways of life would you immediately want to cast out of the VCR of your thoughts? In Genesis 6, there's a story of storm clouds gathering. Noah looks like a fool. He looks like an idiot. He's waiting on some day and he's building his life around building some stupid boat until it wasn't stupid anymore. Church, you see it, you know it, you feel it. In our culture, the storm clouds are gathering. Things that were trustworthy are beginning to shake. People are eating and drinking just like they were in Noah's day. Are there any believers who have the audacity to go all in on the way of Jesus, even if you look like a fool building your life around a storm, you're not sure if it's coming? So, Daniel, are you getting us ready for doomsday? No, 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 no. I'm getting you ready for the glorious king of glory. I'm building my life like Christ wants to show up at any time. I see the clouds and I don't care to be a part of it. I don't want my future well-being to be based on the stock market going up or down. 
I just want to build my life in such a way to where I'm free to invest in it, move on with my life, and just be happy and be free. I want to have the audacity to believe that there is a life worth building on a king that's worth serving. And just like Noah was a fool, your way of life may look foolish to so many, but the clouds will break. And the day the clouds break and the king of glory comes walking in, that's what I'm living for. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus in its essence. So consider the imagery of this text before we quickly jump into the other one. These people at the Sermon on the Mount are tired and hungry. I mean, this is the thing that like, man, if I could just drill this down into us, is like how tired do you have to be to recognize that your way of life is just not working? How big do the cracks have to be? How, I mean, in what way, shape, form, and fashion is it going to take before you say, you know what, I want a new way of life. Now then imagine that exhaustion in Jesus and all of his glory is standing in front of them saying there's a new way to be human. And he's pouring forth this wisdom that they've never heard before about anger, about lust, about oaths, about divorce, about giving your word. He's pouring out about fasting and prayer. And, and he's saying, come on now, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Jesus saying, follow me. This is the image that I would use of our home right now is we have an older daughter who is in high school and our middle child just started high school. So our middle, so we've had way less tears on round two. Round one, man, we were, we were filling up rivers of living dead water of how hard high school is going to be. But Kenzie got to ride in on the coattails of her older sister who lived this thing out. So she got to follow her way. So Jesus is quite literally saying, I am the human you should aspire to live like. I'm about to live this life better than anyone else has ever done it. I'm about to show you what perfect looks like. Follow me. Not just believe that I die and rise again, but follow me. Why did the Sermon on the Mount not just be like a couple sentences? Do you believe I died and rose again? Good. One day I'm coming back. So hold on till then. Be good Jews while I'm gone. Be good Gentiles. No. He said, follow me. It's the invitation that is missing from our faith is that an older brother has gone before you named Christ and he has perfectly lived this life with absolute perfect execution. And you've got to be intellectually arrogant to think that your life is so different than his that they must not apply. Well, you don't know how hard it is on these days. Jesus functionally lived out all of his life in circumstances that were just like ours. But well, Jesus never got blocked on social media. Jesus literally got kissed on the cheek before he was betrayed by his best buddy. I would rather Judas have unfollowed me, to be quite frank with you. Jesus, he's lived this whole thing out. And man, if I had a long enough sermon, we could do that. So Jesus is the better older brother in your life. He's carved a path for you. In fact, Matthew 3, 17, at Jesus' baptism, a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. You want to know what it means to be a good son, a good daughter? Follow this guy. Jesus is the son of God that all children of God should want to be like. It, we, we even see this in the text, and man, if we had a couple hours, that Matthew 7, 21, he says, whoever does the will of my father, but what we see is who does the will of the father perfectly? Jesus. So what does it mean to be a believer who inherits eternal life? It's to do the will of the Father. What does it look like to do the will of the Father? Live like Jesus. It's that simple and that complex. So um, a, a closing point, if there's a, uh, I don't know that we've been doing this three-point sermon, and my Baptist structure left me here, that, but it, it would be this. If the end of life is to see God, the Father, then the only way to live is as the Son did that pleased the Father. You know how you had to do like weird school projects? The teacher explained it made no sense. But then it made sense when they showed you an example from the past. Jesus is the example of the Christian life lived perfectly. So our God is three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit. We've been going through this the last several weeks. The marker of one third of that Trinity is Jesus, the Son of God. Now, if I were to pull the crowd and say, what is the distinct role of Jesus in the redemptive story? So of the Trinity, the distinct role of Jesus, many of us would say, is to die and rise again for my sins, which is so true. I mean, it is so true. 
It is the whole gospel is that Jesus is the propitiation for your sins. And because of his resurrection, that debt was paid in full. But that's just the end of the movie. Could you imagine if you watched uh, like one of my favorite movies, like Titanic, and you said, well, what is it? Tell me about it. And I said, it's about a woman surviving hypothermia in a bad, bad uh, boat wreck. How'd you arrive at that conclusion, Daniel? What was the last scene? She made it, all right? Well, what about Lord of the Rings? What about just getting this little ring in the mountain? Uh, what about the friendship? What about the brothers going up the mountain? Isn't the movie about that too? Isn't it about how the elf and the dwarves and the men all learn how to get together? Could you imagine if you look uh, blessed saint, Mr. Tolkien in the face, and he said, summarize my movie to me. Get the ring in the fire. That's the whole thing. The whole thing's about it. You're like, No. Why would you summarize a story as beautiful and vast and remarkable as Jesus just by the final scene? The final scene's pretty incredible. Don't get me wrong. I get being fixated on it. But the life of Jesus is what it means to be human. He's the perfect example. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. This is so essential. In seven, Matthew 7, 13, it says, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy. It leads to destruction and those who enter it are many. Now verse 14 is really important. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. Sequentially, there's a gate. Then there's a narrow way that leads to life. There is one way to salvation. It's not through Muhammad. It's not praying to Mary. It's not good works. It's not church attendance. There is one gate named Jesus. And through the application of his blood to your sins, you might be saved. And from that day forward, there's a narrow, hard way. Very few will find it. A way of life that is countercultural to every other way of life. This was why people took so long to get baptized in biblical days. Is are you sure you want to believe what Jesus taught on sexuality? Are you sure that you want to pray for your enemies? Do you really believe what he teaches about, about the poor? Do you want to know what Jesus teaches about race? Do you really want to know what Jesus teaches about rest? The gate is essential, but the way is unavoidable. Are you building your life quickly on the words of culture or carefully on the words of Jesus? Notice, very few find it. Very few will dig 10 feet deep intellectually and ask themselves, why do I believe what I believe? Notice in verse 24, Jesus says, whoever hears these words of mine and does them, he doesn't just say, he who believes these words. So there were going to be words that came and words that would continue to come. And the goal of the human life is to follow them. Church, Jesus not only came to die for us, Jesus came to teach and show us how to live. You're supposed to go see Jesus and figure out what it means to do forgiveness. Go see Jesus to figure out work. You're supposed to go see Jesus to figure out rest. You're supposed to go see Jesus to figure out how to walk through unmet expectations. You're supposed to go see Jesus to walk through betrayal. You're supposed to go see Jesus to walk through disputes in your home. You're supposed to go see Jesus. Jesus is the best version of what it means to be human. He is fully and truly human. He, he lived this life. You're supposed to go see Jesus to see how to fill up about money, how to feel about divisive people. You're supposed to go see him for every moment of every day about identity, about purpose, about everything. You're supposed to go see Jesus until there's nothing left of your way of life, which brings us into the second text of today when he says in quite literally, Paul says to them, to the church in Ephesus, because see, Ephesus had teachings, Gentiles had teachings, Jews had teachings. But he says, you have to learn the way of Jesus. You've been taught it. You don't get to be an American who believes in Jesus. You don't get to be a Jew who believes in Jesus. You are my follower, and in every way, shape, form, or fashion, I should inform the way you think if you're my follower. Go see Jesus. 
We moved here from West Nashville, and my friends, pre-cell phone age, would come over and stay the night so we wouldn't see each other. This was before you took selfies and ruined all of the surprises when you see each other after a long time. And they would see me, and when they first showed up, I was already wearing new clothes. Backwards jerseys were turned into Aeropostale polos. And they're asking, they're like, what's going on with this guy? And little by little, the video game, you playing Madden, I'm playing Halo. Do you mean the Beyonce song Halo, you're playing it? Because I know you didn't give up on Madden. I did because these weirdos here don't play these games that we used to play. And little by little, you adopt this new world. That's the idea of what discipleship is. Is it every square? In, discipleship is what Jesus... What's the right word to say? Discipleship is becoming the person Jesus would be if he were you. That's all it is. Figuring out how he would do your job, how he would navigate your space. It's something like a spot the difference photo. This is a spot the difference photo here. That on one side, you're like, okay, what's different? Discipleship to Jesus is just saying, oh, that leaf right there and the Jesus picture, it's not in my picture. So I've got to figure out if this leaf is supposed to be in my life. So discipleship looks like this next slide right here. It's waking up and saying, oh, in the right picture, this is the wrong color. And I build my life on that. This is just a silly example of what it means to follow the way of Jesus. This is about more than church. This is about figuring out what Jesus taught on violence. What would Jesus think about the way you view sports? This is hard to think through, but what he's saying is, is before you can be formed into the image of Jesus, you have to discern how America has formed you into the image of an American. Listen, you are not just the way you are because of trauma. If you get a greed problem, it wasn't because you grew up broke, it's because you have a greed problem. And you were taught it was okay for 20 years and 30 years and 40 years. Now the trauma may be lighting that up more and more and more, but you are the way you are because you've been discipled in the way you are. And you've got to figure out how have I been discipled in ways that aren't like Jesus. And listen, I love our country, but I will affirm no way of life that is not found in Christ Jesus. So this is what discipleship looks like. It's conformed. So you're being conformed. It's four steps. I think we have this. Conformed, deformed, counterformed, and transformed. We don't have time to get into this, but you've been conformed your whole life. And Jesus would say all of those teachings are deformed. So you've got to figure out how your country, how your parents, how your personal opinions have formed you in a way that are not according to Jesus. Figure those out so that you can be transformed. And Jesus is what we do is we hold him up next to our way of life and say, did Jesus feel about work the way I feel about work? Did Jesus do rest the way I do rest? Did Jesus do prayer the way I do prayer? Did Jesus do forgiveness the way I do forgiveness? Put another way. If Jesus is your savior, he must also be your rabbi. All of you has fallen and all of you must be healed by Jesus until there's no square inch of your host culture available. The central teaching of scripture is that you're totally depraved. So if you're totally depraved, that means you are spiritually, physically, and mentally sold into sin. Put another way, your body, heart, and mind all have to be healed by Jesus. When we get saved, I know many of us think, yes, my body does need to be healed. I have inordinate desires for sexuality. Maybe even my heart. I want the wrong things too much, but we don't think about our mind ever. We never think about that. So if you have an anger problem, you may think, yeah, I've got to learn to calm down. Get my body in check. But before you can do that, you need to learn What should you be angry about according to scripture and what does anger look like? Because you're trying to force your body to not believe what your mind actually does believe. See, this is actually a thinking faith. Dallas Willard says, as we first turned away from God in our thoughts, so it is that in our thoughts, the first movement towards the renovation of the heart occur. Thoughts are the place where we can and must begin to change. The process of spiritual formation in Christ is one of progressively replacing those destructive images and ideas with the images and ideas that fill Jesus himself. 
There's one instance in scripture of someone who wanted to be saved and not follow the way of Jesus. His name is the rich young ruler and he is not a believer. If you have no desire to follow the way of Jesus, you are not a believer in Jesus. Here's how the logic goes. Well, why are you saved for your sins? Because Jesus was the perfect spotless sacrifice for my sins. So he was perfect, which means his life was perfect. Yeah, yeah, because that's the only way that I would have forgiveness of sins. So if his life was perfect, what would that mean about you? That anything that doesn't align with his is sin. There it is. So Jesus did prayer perfect. He did fasting perfect. Jesus did sexuality perfect. He did relationships perfect. So to say that the way of Jesus doesn't apply to your life is to say that he wasn't perfect, which is to say that you're not forgiven. Because he was just a flawed good dude like you. This is how ferocious the gospel should be. So how do we become like Jesus? Paul says these words, and these words broke my heart because I see us. In Ephesians 4, 20 through 21, he says, this is not the way you learned in Christ, assuming you've heard. I don't think many of us have been taught to follow the way of Jesus. So when we do things like practicing the way, that seems like extracurricular nonsense. But are these not the ways you see in Jesus? I think maybe what we could do is I want to show you how to learn the way of Jesus. Three questions in study of scripture. Question one, they'll put them on the screen. What does this text reveal about God? Two, what does this reveal about the rhythms, ethic, conduct, and beliefs of Jesus? And then three, how do those two answers change the way I live? So let's use a text, Matthew 8, 23, and this will be it, I promise. Jesus is asleep in a boat. They wake Jesus up. How do we preach that? You just got to trust the Lord and he'll stop your storm. Okay, what if you apply it this way? What does this reveal about God? God is the God who's more powerful than the storm. Okay. What does this reveal about the rhythms, ethics, conducts, or beliefs? So the rhythms, what does Jesus do daily? What rhythms do we see? What is his ethics? What does Jesus teach on forgiveness, anger, things like that? His conduct, how does he apply the beliefs that he has? You know, because in one place he said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, but then he never asked anyone to actually tangibly cut their hands off. So how do we then deal with that? And then what did Jesus believe about the Old Testament? What did Jesus believe about God? What did Jesus believe about the divinity of the Father? So going back to our text where Jesus calms the waves, what does that mean about the rhythms of Jesus? When Jesus was in his most pressured seasons, he chose sleep when he could. Hmm, how does that inform my life? How did he actually apply that? By sleeping. Why was he asleep? Because of his belief in the Father. That's what it means to read scripture to find the way of Jesus. Who cares if your favorite worship song, you just keep yelling on the bridge, win, be still, win, be still. That's not your job. Your job is to say, what did Jesus do? And then do that. Well, I'm not in a storm. You, what would you call your life right now? Well, I'm going to work seven days a week and never stop. Where do you see that in Jesus? Which gets down to the discipleship. Will you change what you see? What do we see in Gethsemane? Last example. What does Gethsemane reveal about God? God will allow the people he loves to suffer. What does this reveal about the rhythms of Jesus? When Jesus was about to go through an incredible temptation, he fasted. So if I'm going through incredible temptation, I can't deal with lust. What about the rhythms? Are you embracing the rhythms of Jesus? What about the ethics, the conduct, the belief that you see in Gethsemane? Put simply, the ways of Jesus are reliable because they're sustaining and good. I want to bring us to an area of repentance. Bow your head and close your eyes. Paul 
says these words in Ephesians. He says, but their minds are darkened and their hearts are hardened. The two reasons you will see the way of Jesus and reject them is your mind is darkened. What does this mean? A leading brainwashing expert says the way people change first is by getting an image of who they hope to be. Who is your image of success when you close your eyes? Would you define a philosopher who doesn't believe in Jesus as successful because he's so smart? The scriptures would call him a fool. I believe this person is successful because they're witty on podcast. But if they reject the teachings of Jesus, the teachings say that he or she is a fool. Is the most successful person you know some mom on a blog that you've never met? Because if so, you're lifting her up in your brain. And you're trying to figure out how to live her rhythms, her ways, her pace. We consider people successful by how powerful they are and how attractive they are. But the Christian lifts up Jesus and says, he's the most successful person. So how can I be like him? Is Jesus the most successful person in your brain? Or is it some financial expert who was debt free at 30? Now I'm not saying they're all failures. I'm saying who's the most successful person in your brain? Who's the most successful lover? Who's the most successful father? Who's the most successful brother? And you say, well, Jesus wasn't a father. That's when you got to start to look around and say, who are the men that I know that are most trying to be like Jesus? And that's my image of success. That's the vision that I want to affirm. Stop looking on Instagram to define what a successful woman is. But who are the women who say the most successful person I've ever seen is Jesus. He's the most compelling image I've ever seen. I don't want to be a good Roman. I want to be a good Jesus person. I don't want to be a superstar. I want to be like Jesus. And he says their hearts are hardened because of their greed and sensuality. If your heart is hell-bent on sin, you will reject the way of Jesus because the way of Jesus will not get you greed and sexuality. It will get you freedom and purity. So church, as we close this series, I call you to repentance today. Are you truly a follower of Jesus? Or an interested ruler? When was the last time you changed something in your life just because you saw Jesus did it differently?